Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Wood. I'm the Special Projects Manager for Early Music America, and we want to thank you for joining us again for another of our Monday interest sessions. Uh, today we have Dorian Bandy with us. We're uh, very excited to, to hear this talk today, and um, we'll have a couple of housekeeping things here up front, um, but I wanted to draw your attention uh, to our website uh, first, which is earlymusicamerica.org, where you can find out about the EMA Relief Fund, which supports uh, early musicians in need during this time of the global pandemic. Uh, you can also find out about upcoming, uh, upcoming EMA online interest sessions and other activities at our website. Uh, also invite you to follow us on our various social media platforms, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. This video and past videos uh, that we have recorded, these webinars and other meetings are available on our YouTube channel, as well as past performances from our Young Performers Festival and our Emerging Artists Showcase and others uh, on YouTube. And then if you'd like to get information from EMA, you can sign up for our email. We send a Tuesday email every single week. Uh, you can sign up at the bottom of earlymusicamerica.org with a click on the button that's there, or you can send a text to 42828 and uh, put early music as the message, and you will um, have a sign up function that will go uh, from there. So, like I said a, a moment ago, uh, we have our guest today is Dorian Banding. He's going to be uh, giving this presentation today. There's a Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you want to ask a question at any time throughout the presentation, please enter your question into that box. Uh, and uh, we will be monitoring that. I'll be monitoring that and uh, we'll be uh, interjecting a little bit to, to uh, if there are pertinent questions at that moment uh, in the presentation. Uh, and if there are any that uh, we feel might be best uh, held to the end, we'll hold some of those to the end and we'll save about 10 minutes at the end for follow-up questions or anything like that. So please use the Q&A function. Uh, if you are attending via Zoom right now instead of Facebook Live, and you have a question about uh, something else, you can always send me a private message using the chat function. Uh, otherwise, we do ask that all of the questions be submitted through the Q&A function. If you're uh, watching on Facebook Live right now, uh, we welcome you all as well. And uh, we will try to keep an eye on those comments as well if you have questions, um, but that's, a, that's a, a not quite as easy to do while we have the Zoom going as well. Uh, but we do invite your questions and there will be information about how to contact uh, Dorian uh, outside of this meeting uh, that we'll have in a few minutes. So um, uh, Dorian, thank you so much for, uh, for joining us today. And uh, we're really excited to, to uh, hear what you have to say. Yes. Um, hey, thank you so much for uh, having me and indeed for organizing all these sessions. Um, I'll just start by saying how much I've enjoyed the sessions that I watched previously. And I hope that everybody finds this to be a stimulating and uh, even more, I, I think, provocative addition to the collection. Uh, and before I start, I'll also just say that I'd like to thank EMA for everything that, that you're doing to support the early music community through what has been and uh, will continue to be quite a difficult time. So I hope that anybody who is in a position to do so will join me in donating to EMA's relief fund for musicians who have been affected by the pandemic. Uh, okay, so having said that, here I go. Um, I'm going to talk today about the role of evidence and speculation in historical performance. And I think unlike some of the other talks that I've heard so far in this series, this is not really going to be a presentation of actual historical research. I will kind of bring Mozart in at the end, but uh, it's not even really going to be a talk about Mozart uh, or about any specific musical or historical issues in historical performance. Uh, I guess the motivation for the way I'm framing this is that this is obviously a moment when a lot of us suddenly have a break from performing, which means we have time to reflect a bit on what we do and why and how we do it. Uh, and so I thought it might be nice to take advantage of that opportunity to think about some of these bigger issues behind historical performance. So not just the notes that we're playing and the instruments we use and the techniques, but uh, some of the philosophical baggage that comes with early music. Uh, 
Uh, and I should say early music does have a lot of philosophical baggage. And a lot of this has been quite well explored in recent decades. So for instance, the work concept is a question that has been raised by a lot of historical performance and a lot of very brilliant philosophers of music have dealt with it. Uh, the same thing with authenticity, what authenticity means, uh, what it is, whether it's something to aspire to. Uh, these questions have been dealt with. The questions of composers' intentions and how much we as modern living musicians have a responsibility to follow what we think we know of the intentions of dead composers. Um, there are a lot of questions there, not only about what those intentions are, how noble they are, but also uh, whether there's an ethical obligation on our end to take them seriously. All of these areas have been really thoroughly explored as people have thought about what early music is all about. But um, I think the two areas have been sort of underdeveloped in all of the thinking that's been done about historical performance. And those two areas are evidence and ethics. Uh, ethics is a very big topic, especially as it relates to musical performance. I just hinted a little bit at what it can mean, uh, this question of whether living performers have an obligation to dead composers. Uh, it can also mean a lot of other things as well. And I'm not gonna address those today. Today, I'm gonna talk about the evidence side of things. Um, and. Uh, the main motivation for this is that evidence is, I think, really intrinsically interesting, this question of how we know stuff and why. Um, and uh, there are a lot of different perspectives about how evidence might work and how we as historical performers uh, should use it or do use it. So uh, on the one hand, there's this sort of popular view that historical performers are slaves to evidence. A lot of people from outside the field uh, will say that one of the reasons they don't necessarily want to go into historical performance is that they don't want to be bound by evidence. They want to be able to follow their musical intuitions. And even some people within historical performance have talked about evidence as being a sort of limiting factor that constrains musicianship. So there was a very famous polemic by Lawrence Dreyfus uh, from the 1980s, just as early music was getting going. It's uh, in an article called Early Music Defended Against Its Devotees. And Dreyfus accuses uh, most mainstream early musicians of having a very positivistic agenda where they're just looking at evidence and trying to render that evidence in sound and, and in the process sort of effacing everything that makes music a humanistic and warm and loving and fuzzy pursuit. Um, and this, this critique was taken up later by Richard Taruskin um, who focused on Christopher Hogwood and said that he's the kind of musician who just plays from the evidence. He, I think Taruskin put it something like he needs a green light from the boss before he can make any musical decisions. Um, and Peter Kivy writing, uh, writing after both of them didn't talk so explicitly about the evidence problem, but did uh, in the way he framed authenticity, he, he talked about the other authenticity that is not, uh, not authenticity in terms of fidelity to a work or to a composer, but authenticity in terms of a performer's fidelity to that performer, him or herself. Uh, the way Kivy framed that even implies that somehow uh, the authenticity to the self of the performer is incompatible with other forms of uh, fidelity, either historical accuracy when it comes to performing styles or taking composer's intention seriously. Uh, Kivy framed this very much as a zero sum relationship. Um, now, so that's one view of how his historical performance has used evidence. Uh, within the historical performance community, I think that the perception is quite different. I think that uh, definitely for myself and for a lot of uh, the colleagues that I know, we tend to see evidence in a much more flexible way, that evidence is one of those things that can help us give expressive performances, but it's not necessarily something that is limiting our expressive palette. It's something, you know, we find out what some past practice was like, and that's a way for us to be even more expressive. That's another idea that we can use. And we're no longer thinking about evidence in this kind of slavish way. Uh, there are a lot of practices uh, in which people just blatantly ignore the evidence. Uh, most of the violinists that I work with don't hold the violin the way Geminiani says they should, even though I think it's pretty clear from his treatise and from a lot of extant paintings that that's how people were holding it. Same thing, a lot of keyboardists don't choose to play with 18th century fingerings because that's a little bit inconvenient if they have a lot of practice with modern techniques. So we tend to take this very flexible view of evidence where in some ways we're very strict and rigid. Uh, I think it's rare at this point to see uh, orchestras playing Baroque music with 
without Baroque bows. In some cases, we take the evidence quite seriously. But in other ways, we pick and choose. We don't necessarily feel we have to hold the violin the way Gemignani wanted us to just because he happened to be alive at that point. Um, now, so already I think there's, there's some uncomfortable uh, tensions in the way we're thinking about evidence. We, we tend to accord different weights to different kinds of evidence. We take some seriously and we don't take others so seriously. Uh, there seem to be some contradictions in the way that we're thinking about all this. So I thought that it could be useful to just talk a bit about evidence, uh, what it is, how it works, uh, what it can mean for us. And I'll start by saying that I suspect that most of us who have considered this issue have done so from the point of view of treatises. Treatises tend to be the most uh, widely used, wide, widely cited, and I think they're generally seen as being the most reliable pieces of evidence that survive from the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. Uh, but for most of us who went from reading about treatises to actually reading those treatises, one of the things that we encountered when we read those treatises was that in fact they are rather problematic. That, uh, for example, treatises tend to be very general about how you should phrase or think about musicianship, whereas individual pieces of music, when we're actually sitting down to perform something, um, we are uh, we're thinking about specifics. So for example, Leopold Mozart or C.P.E. Bach can talk about how slurs should be treated as diminuendos, but what about that particular slur in that particular piece? There's an example that Malcolm Bilson, the forte pianist, has talked about quite a lot, the opening of Mozart's F major piano sonata, K332, where there's a slur over uh, every one of the first, I think, five or six bars of the, of the piece, and yet the melodic shapes in each bar are so different that it's unlikely that the slurs all mean the same thing, yet the treatises just give us this sort of general view of what slurs should mean. There are also questions about how applicable certain treatises are to specific repertoires. So uh, people who are working on Italian repertoire, uh, it may not be the case that between Gemignani and Tartini, they have enough information to actually know what was being done in a particular city at a particular time. But often we're, we find ourselves kind of approximating our treatise use, thinking, well, yes, Mozart was in this city in the 1760s, therefore maybe there's a treatise from around that time that applies to his music, but it's not always clear how specific our treatise choices really are. So there's that issue. There's also the issue of the biases of the treatise author that, that very often, especially with the quirky authors like Matheson and Klantz, uh, it's not always clear whether we are learning about a practice that was widespread at the time or whether we're just uh, getting a sense of how strange and personal this individual author was. Um, but I think most of all, so those are all some problems with treatises, but the biggest problem I think is that treatises can't play or sing for us. Uh, they talk about music in language, but they don't actually give us a demonstration of what they're saying, which means we're always reading them with our modern uh, 21st century eyes, ears, minds, uh, and translating their words into musical advice using those preconceptions. So uh, that seems to me the biggest issue. And it's striking, it's, you know, it's often been observed that early music, which grew up in the 1960s and 70s, uh, had shared very much the aesthetic of ultra modern music of the time in, in terms of the cleanliness of the performances um, and the stance to vibrato and all that. And it's, it's really easy to think that in fact, uh, that's, that's a demonstration of just how much these old sources when we read them can be shaped to our modern preconceptions that what we are used to hearing will change uh, how we read these texts. So uh, these are some of the problems that we have encountered when we played old music, that, uh, that the sources that we usually think about as being the main sources of evidence are not always uh, either reliable, trustworthy, uh, things that we can take seriously without getting our own readings tangled up in them. Um, now, for me, as a historical performer, I have two uh, main interests, I think, when it comes to things uh, for which I would love to know more about how, how um, contemporary practice was. Uh, one of them is the, the violin sound in the 17th century German repertoire. I would love to know what kind of sound Walter and Bieber and their colleagues made when they played the violin. I suspect it was very different from what's described in French and Italian treatises, but there's very little information on this. We, we know a little bit, but it really not so much. And the other big obsession of my musical career has been to try to understand how Mozart and Beethoven improvised. Uh, and in general, how they thought of their own music, how they performed it, and how their performances influenced their approach to composition. And that's, that's been mainly the path that I've followed in my work as a musicologist. Now, um, 
one of the reasons these questions are very interesting to me is because they're not at all superficial questions. They're not just about how one note might've been played about a single slur in one bar of a Mozart sonata. They're, they're really about kind of fundamental issues that would, that would really deeply alter the way we think about overall sound of music, overall understanding of it, interpretation of it, the way we listen to it. Um, so they're not local issues. They're very broad and I, I would almost say fundamental issues in the way we think about and perform this repertoire. Um, so having said all that, uh, one of the problems, of course, with evidence in general, when we think about how we can know more about these old practices is that uh, even in principle, there isn't any evidence for this. Music is a living art, and it's one of those, it's, it's one of those arts that does not exist in a series of documents, unlike, for example, a painting or a novel where you can you can pick up a text and see the very ink strokes that an author put on a page or look at a painting and see uh, plus or minus some age-related decay. You can see basically what the artist created. With music, um, to translate the notes on a page into actual sound has to be done anew every time it's done. Uh, and that means that the music itself is a bit of a moving target, that performances and practices are lost as soon as they happen. And uh, as we all know, it can be difficult enough to talk about music that we have witnessed when we've seen somebody play it. It can be uh, infinitely harder to talk about music uh, that we have never heard played. Uh, and so that's one of the interesting things about this issue of evidence, particularly in uh, improvisations from the 18th century, improvisations that we didn't hear and uh, for which there is by definition no living record. Um, so having said all that, uh, I'm going to talk a bit about how we might think about evidence and I'm not going to give over the next half hour or so that I'm talking, I'm not going to give any actual answers to anything. I'm going to just present some uh, ways of thinking that might reframe what we think we're doing when we interact with some of this repertoire. And there are two fields uh, that have developed a very sophisticated philosophy of how you should think about and deal with evidence. Those two fields are the philosophy of science and maybe to a lesser degree, but still to quite a, um, a high degree, the philosophy of history. And I'm going to talk about both of those. They actually complement each other surprisingly well. And I say surprisingly because in many ways, science seems to be at odds with history, that scientific thinking is very much uh, in general focused on the content of ideas and their, their propositional values rather than on the history of those ideas. It's possible, for instance, to understand effectively everything about the theory of, of evolution without knowing anything about Victorian England. Uh, and so in some sense, there seems to be a sort of superficial conflict between the way science deals with the idea of history and the way history might deal with it. But both the philosophy of science and the philosophy of history have dealt with this problem of evidence. And uh, in particular, two thinkers from these fields have dealt with it in, in a very insightful and powerful way. These thinkers are in philosophy of science, Karl Popper, uh, who revolutionized epistemology, the philosophy of knowledge, uh, beginning in the 1930s. And um, in the philosophy of history, a philosopher call, called R.G. Collingwood, uh, who died in the early 40s, and his writings on history were gathered into a collection that was published after his death. And they're uh, incredibly insightful. And I'll, I'll read from both Popper and Collingwood in a bit. Uh, to begin with Popper, uh, Popper's insight in the philosophy of science was to criticize the common sense view, the prevailing notion of how science works. Now, this prevailing notion uh, has many variations, but it basically goes something like this, that uh, you start with observing something about the natural world, and that observation should be, of course, extremely careful. Uh, and you, you observe, you gather data, and uh, you synthesize this evidence into some grand theory that tells you how the world works. This view, uh, as I say, it has various different guises, but um, this view is called empiricism. David, you can advance to the, um, the first slide where I list, um, yes, there we go. Uh, so this view is called empiricism. It's the idea that knowledge is derived from sensory experience. And it's very closely related to another view that prevailed in science for quite a long time uh, called induction, which is apparently a method of reasoning in which premises can uh, be thought to provide some, but not all support for the truth of a conclusion. Uh, and uh, this is often, though not always, uh, it comes in the form that we think we derive general principles from specific observations. Now, both of these are false. Both of these are misconceptions. And uh, Popper's insight was to point out how and why they are misconceptions. Uh, thanks, David. That is all we need for that, um, that slide. 
Uh, now, uh, Popper pointed out that empiricism is flawed on a number of levels. First of all, this idea that all data, uh, that, sorry, that all um, knowledge can come through the senses uh, is self-defeating in that we can't actually, with our senses, experience the process by which sensory stimulus will turn into knowledge. So there's a logical inconsistency there. Uh, but more importantly, uh, the flaw is that any individual observations will be compatible with an infinite number of theories. Uh, to take just one extreme example, uh, the observation that the planets move a certain way is compatible both with the idea that uh, the planets are actually moving that way and with the idea that some evil spirit has intervened to just make it look like they're moving a certain way. And once you think of it in that way, you, you realize that, as I say, any single observation can, can be seen as being part of any number of different theories. So the idea that we can derive a theory from these individual observations uh, is logically incoherent. And um, uh, another problem with empiricism that Popper pointed out is, for example, that, uh, that it leads to a, a regress, that once we start to think we need to justify uh, how we think about individual instances of observations, uh, we realize that to actually show that uh, what those observations were requires that we show how we arrived at every bit of knowledge that led to those observations. And uh, there's a, a passage in Popper, I'll just take out my my copy of one of his books, Conjectures and Refutations, uh, where he quotes Mark Twain and says that Mark Twain actually anticipated this criticism of empiricism. Uh, Mark Twain says that one of his first jobs was as a newspaper reporter and the editor of his newspaper instructed him never to report anything unless he could verify it or confirm it by personal knowledge. Twain uh, proceeded to attend a social event and describe it in these words. This is a quote from Twain. A woman giving the name of Mrs. James Jones, who is reported to be one of the society leaders of the city, is said to have given what purported to be a party yesterday in a number of, with a, sorry, uh, to a number of alleged ladies. The hostess claims to be the wife of a reputed attorney. And Twain goes on and at every step uh, tries to hedge because he couldn't actually confirm each individual portion of the argument. Um, anyway, Popper pointed out all of this about empiricism, that uh, knowledge cannot actually derive from sensory experience in this way. And uh, this, as I say, this seems in many ways to conflict with the common sense view of science, that we start from carefully observing things and then proceed from there to general theories. This even conflicts with, in many cases, the testimony of scientists themselves, right? We look at somebody like Darwin, who uh, apparently he thought simply observed enough different animal species on the Galapagos Islands to be able to synthesize this into some into a theory of evolution. And we think that this must be a way that science works. But as Popper showed, it's logically inconsistent. Uh, Popper's model for how science proceeds is that it starts when the scientist simply comes up with some conjecture, some guess about the nature of reality. And from that guess, reasons about what we should expect to experience based on that model of the world. And then it's, it's um, at that point in the theory that we have some specific deductions from the general guess about reality that we can test them and that we can do the observations, find the evidence. So in Popper's model, it's important to say uh, evidence still plays a role. It's not that evidence has been uh, removed entirely. It's simply that the role of evidence is to refute the guess that has been made, that from every guess you can derive a certain number of predictions and those predictions can then be either borne out or not borne out by actual observation and evidence. Uh, it's worth pointing out that another in general problem with the common sense view of science is that evidence as such has been around forever. Uh, there has been evidence uh, available every time an apple has fallen from a tree or every time somebody has looked up at the night sky. The thing that gets the scientific process going is not more evidence. The thing that gets the process going is a way of thinking about reality that differs from the previous way that makes somebody see the evidence in a different way. So uh, for instance, we can think about Galileo and the Inquisition, both looking through the same telescope, seeing uh, what appeared to be the same views of the night sky, the same photons were striking their retinas. But Galileo and the Inquisition derived extremely different meanings from these. Uh, Galileo saw the Earth as being in orbit around the sun and the Inquisition did not. Um, so again, the evidence itself is not the thing that makes the theory. Evidence is simply something that slots in to a way of thinking that it comes from a creative conjecture, some guess about how reality is. Um, now, Evidence, as I say, evidence is still valuable, but only in as much as it fits into the scheme that we come up with in our conjecture. Now, um, 
it should be said that even though that was a rather cursory overview of, of Popper's theory of knowledge, it already has the power to apply to and revolutionize how we think about almost every aspect of life. And I'll talk about some of those applications as we go on specifically in the arts and music. But uh, it's worth pointing out that from that rather simple observation that, uh, that we don't start by gathering evidence and reason from there, that rather we start by guessing and then use evidence to refute the guesses. From that one rather simple point, so many riches can be derived. Um, now, Popper himself applied this idea to history. And he noted that often in a sort of common sense view, history is a series of reports of eyewitnesses uh, so, for example, somebody read somebody who read somebody who read somebody who read somebody who saw some great event happen. And Popper points out that actually that's, that isn't really how history works, that even in history, evidence isn't quite used that way, that we are quite skeptical of evidence that we find, that evidence doesn't have any special authority in the way we do history, that evidence is still, even when we find something in the historical record, we are always second guessing it, we're always criticizing it, we're always wondering what this person really mean. Um, and I think most of all, something that I, I find quite valuable in this Popperian way of thinking, aside from the fact that it is correct, uh, something that I find valuable in it is the, the way it deals with the unseen. Popper emphasizes that we're always explaining the scene in terms of the unseen, that we see apples falling, but we don't see curved space-time. And yet curved space-time is fundamental for our explanation of why the apples are falling, that there's always some unseen mechanism at work. Uh, and in history, I think that the philosophers of history have had to deal largely with this issue of the unseen. Uh, of course, in history, the unseen is unseen for different reasons than the unseen is unseen in the real world. Uh, it's unseen not only because it may be invisible in principle like curved space-time, but it's unseen because we're not there to see it that we don't necessarily have that eyewitness testimony. Uh, and indeed, as Popper points out, uh, in many ways, the most important historical facts are precisely those that even in principle can't be seen. That for example, uh, the question of why Napoleon did something, what was it that changed his mind? What was he thinking the day that he made some military decision is often much more important than, than the mere fact of at what time of day or on what day some event occurred. Now, uh, R.G. Collingwood, a philosopher of history was writing before Popper uh, and didn't actually know Popper. I think that Popper had not even appeared in English by the time Collingwood had died. But Collingwood's work really beautifully anticipates many of the issues in Popper. And I'm going to read a few passages from Collingwood's wonderful book called The Idea of History. Um, Collingwood says, uh, just as Popper criticized the common sense view of science, Collingwood actually criticizes what he calls a common sense view of history. He says, I'll begin by stating what may be called the common sense theory of history, the theory which most people believe or imagine themselves to believe when they first reflect on the matter. And he goes on, according to this theory, the essential things in history are memory and authority. If an event or a state of things is to be historically known, uh, first of all, someone must be acquainted with it. Then he must remember it. Then he must state his recollection of it in terms intelligible to another. And finally, that other must accept his statement as true. History is thus the believing someone else when he says that he remembers something. The believer is the historian. Uh, the person believed is called his authority. And this doctrine implies that historical truth, so far as it is at all accessible to the historian, is accessible to him only because it exists ready-made in the ready-made statements of his authorities. These statements are to him a sacred text whose value depends wholly on the unbrokenness of the tradition they represent. I'll skip ahead a bit and Collingwood says that, um, that one has only to state this common sense view to see how absurd it is and how wrong it must be. Uh, and he points out a few ways in which it's wrong, but one in particular that I want to just focus on for a moment um, is this statement from a little bit later in the text. Uh, Collingwood says that the autonomy of historical thought is seen at its simplest in the work of selection. The historian who tries to work on the common sense theory and accurately reproduce what he finds in his authorities resembles a landscape painter who tries to work on that theory of art which bids the artist copy nature. He may fancy that he's reproducing in his own medium the actual shapes and colors of natural things, but however hard he tries to do this, he is always selecting, simplifying, schematizing, leaving out what he thinks unimportant and putting in what he regards as essential. It is the artist and not nature that is responsible for what goes into the picture. 
In the same way, no historian, not even the worst, merely copies out his authorities. Even if he puts in nothing of his own, which is never really possible, he is always leaving out things which, for one reason or another, he decides that his own work does not need or cannot use. He is, therefore, and not his authority, uh, yeah, sorry, it is he, therefore, and not his authority, that is responsible for what goes in. On that question, he is his own master. His thought is to that extent autonomous. And again, I'll skip a bit. Uh, and Collingwood goes on, I think this is the last section I'm gonna read. And he says that the clearest demonstration of the historian's autonomy, however, is provided by historical criticism. As natural science finds its proper method when the scientist in Bacon's metaphor puts nature to the question, tortures her by experiment in order to wring from her answers to his own questions. So history finds its proper method when the historian puts his authorities in the witness box. And by cross-questioning extorts from them information which in their original statements they have withheld either because they did not wish to give it or because they did not possess it thus a commander's dispatches may claim a victory the historian reading them in a critical spirit will ask if it was a victory why was it not followed up in this or that way and may thus convict the writer of concealing the truth. Let me just pause and note that when he says, if it was a victory, why was it not followed up in this or that way? This is very Popperian of him. What he's done, even though he doesn't say it to us, what he's done is say that he has a theory of victory, some explanation of how victory makes people act. And under that explanation, one should expect to see certain behavior following a victory. And in this case, Collingwood is noting that the historical record doesn't show that that behavior took place. And that's making him think, hmm, maybe this was not actually a victory in the straightforward sense. Maybe he should uh, uh, take into question the veracity of what his so-called authority has said. Um, I'll go on. So uh, he may convict the writer of concealing the truth, or by using the same method, he may convict of ignorance, a less critical predecessor who has accepted the version of the battle given him by the same dispatches. Uh, Collingwood goes on. This is, sorry, this is the last section I'll read. Collingwood goes on. As history does not depend on authority, so it does not depend on memory either. The historian can rediscover what has been completely forgotten in the sense that no statement of it has reached him by an unbroken tradition from eyewitnesses. He can even discover what, until he discovered it, no one ever knew to have happened at all. This he does partly by the critical treatment of statements contained in his sources, partly by the use of what are called unwritten sources, which are increasingly employed as history becomes increasingly sure of its own proper methods and its own proper criterion. And he goes on to talk about the imagination as the main criteria, as the main engine of historical thinking. He even says at one point in a statement that I find to be sort of infinitely inspiring that uh, when we find the historical record unintelligible, it's only because we have uh, come up against a limitation of our own imaginations. And that if we just widen the imagination a bit, then we can make sense of it. Um, now, again, the point is that there's always an overarching theory that one starts with. It comes from the imagination and uh, it, it functions as an explanation by which one can understand how smaller details will fit in. And it's there that evidence begins to matter, that there's a web of thinking in which evidence might end up providing some fixed points, but in which the main structures come from the imagination. Now, this way of thinking about evidence and explanation fits in to our understanding of music and the arts in a few ways. And I'll talk about mainly two of them here. So one of them is um, how we think about our general relationship with music as something to be explained. Um, this is a, an interesting overlap between the arts and sciences. Uh, the, the way, I think the way we encounter a work of art is not actually so different from the way we encounter a phenomenon in the natural world. We want to understand it, we want to explain it, and uh, that can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, for example, in the case of some rock formation, understanding how it came to exist in a certain way. It can also mean in the case, for example, of a very attractive sunset, what it is that makes it look like that, which is not necessarily the same question of how it came into existence, but the question of why the laws of physics and optics make the sunset look a particular way. And I think this is not so different from how we encounter works of music, that we might wonder uh, when we encounter a particularly striking piece by a great composer, how on earth did this get composed? How did a mere human, a mere mortal, uh, put these notes together in such a magnificent and profound way? So that's one way in which uh, the sorts of structures of explanations that we look for when we deal with history or science are not necessarily so different from those that we look for when we deal with a work of, mu a work of music. Um, and this feeds then into the second way that I think this thinking about evidence can structure the way we think about music. And that is uh, in terms of the explanations that we build and the way they influence our performances and our theories about how individual works of art 
function. Uh, I think that one of the striking things, I mentioned this earlier about early music and how it grew up in the 60s and uh, was very much structured by the, the aesthetic tastes of that era in, in modern music. Uh, something that we can see when we look at the way people have interacted with music at all times is that just as empiricism is false when we deal with the natural world, empiricism is false when we deal with works of art. We don't actually simply engage with works of art directly. We always come to them and encounter them with a set of preconceptions. As Karl Popper put it, all observation is theory laden or knowledge laden. We always observe in light of theories that we hold. And we can actually see, for example, with Mozart in the history of Mozart interpretation, how much broad cultural theories and explanations have structured the way people interact with music. So uh, from the beginning of the 19th century, when people had very specific romantic views of genius and creativity and originality, people also thought about Mozart in a very particular way. It's striking that in the beginning of the 19th century, the most performed works of Mozart were his minor key works and operas like Don Giovanni, things that, that fit in extremely well with broader cultural notions about how music worked. And uh, later in the 19th century, during the Victorian era, when Mozart became a kind of eternal child and became this very innocent figure, uh, this set of performed works was expanded to include pieces like The Marriage of Figaro. Uh, it's interesting that Cosi Fantute had uh, something like only 10 or 16 known productions in the 19th century, whereas Figaro and Don Giovanni were performed hundreds and hundreds of times. And it's largely because they fit into the 19th century view of how music worked and these broader cultural issues such as genius, the self, humor, all of these things. Uh, and into the 20th century, all of this changed again. People began to see Mozart as a kind of workmanlike figure who would absorb the norms of his time and then studiously compile them, whether in the form of topics or schemata or partimenti, into his musical compositions. Uh, this musicological view grew up at the same time as the early music movement, which also tried to put Mozart in context. At all times, we can see these cultural uh, preconceptions structuring the way we interact with music. Uh, now, having said all that, I'm going to talk, I guess I have like 10 minutes left to talk. Uh, I'm going to pivot to the advertised topic which is Mozart's embellishments and uh, what we can think about evidence in the context of a specific problem like embellishment. Um, now, if we, uh, just to give you context, the issue with Mozart's embellishments is that we know that Mozart expected a lot of notes to be added to his compositions when they were performed. He did not expect people to play just what was on the page. Uh, there are two reasons for this. First of all, that was part of the musical culture of the time. Improvisation was highly valued, very much uh, as it is in jazz cultures more recently. Uh, so people who did not improvise were seen as being somehow musically less competent than those who could. Improvisation was fun, edge of your seat, hearing something that is never heard at other times. Another reason for it in Mozart's case is that he wrote very fast. He was, for most of his life, a freelance musician who had to compose in such a way that when a commission came in, he could meet the demands of that commission right away because his livelihood depended on it. So he had to write melodies as quickly as possible, and that often meant that he wrote drafts uh, putting only the bare minimum notes uh, in that he really, really needed to know what to play when he went to perform, which means that a lot of his melodies are written in a kind of skeletal form. Now, we know this not only from the fact that a lot of his compositions actually in the manuscript form show uh, surprisingly sparse melodies where we, where we might expect something else. We know this from some documentary evidence. And David, if you can show us the next slide, this should be an excerpt from Mozart's 16th piano concerto. There's a letter that Mozart uh, wrote to his father. He sent the score of this piece, uh, Piano Concerto K451, to his sister to play. And his sister wrote to Mozart saying that it seems that there's a passage in the slow movement where something's missing and she doesn't quite know what to do with it. There aren't enough notes in this passage and she was quite upset about this. Mozart writes back saying, yes, indeed, she is correct. There are some missing notes there. And um, he provides this little eight bar excerpt to show how the passage should be played. So the middle staff shows what was written in the original score and the top staff shows what Mozart expected the performer to do. Now, a lot of people have tried to understand Mozart's approach to embellishment by examining this passage and, and uh, extrapolating from it. What happens if we try to do that? We'll see that in fact, there's no really good logical way to proceed with this. And this is exactly what we should expect given uh, what I just said about philosophy of knowledge in the sciences. Um, that when we look at this passage, we see some generally uh, stereotypical 18th century gestures. We see some turns as in the first bar and uh, a written out turn in the anti-penultimate bar, a written out turn in the penultimate bar. Um, we also see uh, 
some sort of strange things. For example, in the third bar of the passage, the, the embellished melody departs quite significantly from what's written in the original. The original ascends only a sixth. The embellished version ascends quite a bit more than that. It ascends an octave. And then uh, on the way down, it doesn't just connect the notes. It sort of turns around. Uh, then the next bar, the embellishment is altogether less uh, extravagant. It just adds a single note. Another extravagant embellishment in the bar after that, the first bar of the second line. Uh, my point in, in saying all this is that actually there doesn't seem to be a consistent logic by which Mozart is embellishing. It doesn't seem that he's adding notes in any particular way as far as we can tell from this example. And the problem is that this example is all we have. There are some other passages that people have occasionally thought to be embellishments, for example, in the published versions of Mozart's works, but it's not clear that those actually are embellishments. It could be that he simply uh, was fleshing out a melody that he hadn't written fully in the first draft. Uh, thanks, David. You can take the slide off. Um, so the question is, how can we, uh, how can we think about solving this problem? Now, um, the way we should not do it is to try to extrapolate from the specifics. And one of the reasons that does not work has actually been uh, explained by the music theorist and philosopher of music, Leonard Meyer, who again, like Collingwood, was as Popperian a musical thinker as, as one could imagine. And Meyer writes in his last book, uh, he writes this, one can list and count traits, say the frequency of Sforzandi in Beethoven's music or the number of deceptive cadences in Wagner's operas. But if nothing is known about their functions, structural, processive, expressive, and so on, it will be impossible to explain why they are there, how their presence is related to other features observed. Uh, such traits may even serve as reasonably reliable identifiers of Beethoven's or Wagner's style, yet contribute nothing to our understanding of how that style functions. And the key word there, I think, uh, even though it comes at the very end of his excerpt, is understanding. That there's something beyond simply describing what's in the music that needs to be understood if we are going to replicate a style in any kind of reasonable way. Now, the pitfalls of replicating a style without understanding have actually been uh, demonstrated by a number of 18th century musicians. And uh, David, if you can proceed to the next slide. This is a bit of Tartini. One of the interesting things about the way ornamentation and indeed composition were seen in the 18th century is that they were actually in many ways seen as being largely randomized. A lot of treatises on embellishments in particular state that embellishments don't really have a semantic or a syntactic function, that you just add them as you want. And this page of embellishments from Tartini, reprinted in Cartier's Art of the Violin, actually is noteworthy because by laying the embellishments out in this, in this fashion, it encourages the player to sort of float, uh, float freely between the lines, that you're not tied to any one version of the embellishments. You can create a self-randomizing set of embellishments by just letting your eye drift over the page. And this was a very popular way of thinking about embellishment back then, and indeed about composition also. A number of uh, randomizing devices were used by some composers. There were musical dice games, and the theorist and historian Leonard Ratner actually wrote an essay where he argued that compositions created using musical dice games and other randomizing devices are indistinguishable from compositions created by more carefully thought out means. Uh, and uh, the idea is that in the 18th century, a lot of different uh, kinds of figures were seen as having any number of different functions. Now, um, something that's interesting about this is that, in fact, uh, this is a bit of evidence from the 18th century that I think if we're going to ornament like Mozart or try to revive any of these old practices, we need to call into question. The fact that people in the 18th century thought that embellishment figures didn't necessarily have specific uh, structural functions may be something that they were wrong about. And one of the ways that we can ask whether they were wrong is by um, trying to randomize various aspects of 18th century compositions, putting them into a computer that can randomize them for us and then play them for us and see what comes out. And in fact, a um, musician turned sort of, uh, I don't actually know what to call him, a, a computer musicologist, uh, David Cope, has done something similar. He created a bit of software called Experiments in Musical Intelligence, which would draw figures from works of composers, randomize them, and spit out new compositions. And I found an excerpt that we can listen to, a brief excerpt of one of Cope's Mozart replications. Uh, yes, thank you, David. That slide is the one. And if you can turn on the music in the background while we look at the slide just for a moment, that would be great. I don't think we'll be able to see them both. Oh, we might be able, I might be able to, I'll have to do something different. We can listen or, or we can see, so. <laughs> Let's listen to about 15 seconds of it and then I'll go back to the slide. 
<laughs> yeah, great. Um, and uh, this is a, a bit of the score of that particular Mozart replication. Um, now, what Cope has done is essentially draw examples from three Mozart sonatas. And if you know this repertoire well enough, you can play that game where you try to identify the, um, the sonatas that he's drawn excerpts from. I've labeled a few of them, David, if you could advance. Um, yeah, there we go. So the excerpts come from a few Mozart piano sonatas. But what's striking is that, first of all, um, he has uh, the problem with this, this excerpt is that he's, first of all, combined uh, the the uh, figures without any view towards the function that they serve in the Mozart original. So for example, uh, in the first bar of the second system, what is in the original a transitional uh, bar actually here is shown to have more function. It's, it's uh, placed as though it's actual musical material. Uh, he's combined things that have very different time fields. You can see it just in the durations of the notes that uh, some of these bars just have quarter notes and eighth notes. Other bars have sixteenths, thirty seconds. So he hasn't really uh, bothered to think about the rhythmic value or the metrical theories that Mozart was working with. Uh, again, there's a lack of understanding in how this has been reshuffled. So it actually could be that in the case of embellishment, the 18th century theorists and the musicians who wrote about this issue as though it, it were a random thing were actually incorrect. This is one of those cases where, uh, where, as I say, being skeptical of the evidence that we think we're dealing with is quite useful. Um, now, uh, I guess I don't have so much time left, so I will um, talk about a few ways that we might think about evidence instead in, in this Mozart. Uh, so rather than trying to simply reshuffle embellishments that we think we lift from individual moments of an embellished passage in a Mozart piece, um, we can think, first of all, in an explanatory way, where we think about uh, finding an explanation for how Mozart arrives at the melodies that he arrives at, how Mozart structures them and why, why he writes one note instead of another, rather than just describing his music, actually trying to explain it causally. Uh, to come up with an account of how he writes it and using that account to then try to write embellishments the way he might. That's something that's particularly easy in the case of more extended improvisations because there are a lot of sources of the time that tell us exactly how to actually improvise, say, a fantasia, that you should use descending bass lines, you should use a lot of diminished seventh chords, that there, there's enough concrete advice about how improvisers are thinking, that it's not so difficult to put oneself in the mindset of an improviser from back then and actually try to play out those, those um, approaches. Now, another thing we might do is to ask what Mozart was thinking when he chose a certain style of notation. If David, you could advance to the next slide, I think, is this the next one, an excerpt from, nope, the one after that, skipping this one. If you could, yes, uh, here we go, an excerpt from Cozy. We can ask, for example, for an explanatory theory of Mozart's notational style and the way it relates to performance norms that he might have expected. So this is uh, a bit of Fiordilici's aria from Act Two of Cozy. And you'll see that the soprano ends a phrase in the first bar and then the first half of the second bar of the excerpt, which is then imitated by the horn. You have to do the transposition for yourself, but the horn is actually playing the same uh, pitches that the soprano sings. And it's imitated by the horn in a very highly decorated version. You can see, even if you, um, even if you can't hear it in your head, you can see that Fiordilici sings quarter notes and dotted eighth notes. The horn plays 16th and 32nd notes. And one can think that uh, if one has an explanatory understanding of, for example, how Mozart thought about the role of soloists and orchestras, soloists and accompanists, that you can use this as a kind of negative evidence to imply that, for example, the soloist should not sing something less ornate than what the orchestra does in response, that the orchestra is not telling us exactly what she should embellish, but simply maybe the density with which she should embellish. So that's another model of how we might think about this relationship. Um, there are also more specific things like piano technique. We can think about how Mozart is uh, thinking about the keyboard, how he is interacting with the keyboard, and how that is contributing to the musical structures he's working with. So these are all ways that we can reframe the role of evidence, where it still matters in that we're still trying to use it as a way to overturn bad guesses that we might make. But in general, it's not something that we start with. It's not something that's constraining the way we think about this music. Um, so let me end, and then we'll open it up to questions. Let me end by uh, saying why I think this approach actually can make a great deal of difference to how we think about this music and how we approach it. Um, first of all, it's really interesting to think about evidence in this way. And these philosophies of history and science are themselves fascinating. So aside from the fact that Popper has fundamental insights to offer us, uh, it's quite fun to try to take these and apply them to other fields. But 
also, uh, more specifically for the historical performers among us, uh, making our preconceptions and those theories that we start with as explicit as possible is a way to help us criticize them and change them when they're not good. That uh, if we don't actually know what preconceptions we're laboring under, it can be very difficult to improve our preconceptions. Uh, and of course, we can never get away from preconceptions. We always have them. <laughs> um, uh, and actually, I think this is one of the great things about early music in general is that it's a style of performing that makes those preconceptions as conscious and explicit as possible. It's actually something that that got early music a lot of criticism from its early opponents. Uh, Adorno and Roger Scruton, uh, opponents of early music, have uh, very often criticized it for not being part of a tradition, for having performers who are trying to reinvent their tradition at every generation. But actually, that's one of the most empowering aspects of it, that by making those preconceptions explicit, we can also try to design them well. Um, and also, maybe most importantly, the last thing I'll say is that uh, this offers an account of how progress happens. Uh, just like in science, progress does not happen when you do more observations or more experiments or gather more data. Progress in science happens when you have new ideas that fundamentally ch change the way we think about old ideas. So uh, we didn't overturn Newtonian mechanics by dropping more things and seeing how fast they fell or doing more experiments. We uh, we have entirely new explanations for how gravity works. We have curved space-time, things that were not even implied in Newton's worldview. Uh, and in the same way in music, I think that it's important to think that progress does not come from doing another analysis or another performance of a piece of music, but rather comes from uh, engaging in a broader and more profound shifts of how we think about, listen to, perform this music. Uh, so I'll stop there and let's open it up for questions. Yes, and we do have uh, a few questions that came in uh, throughout it. And, and uh, if, if anyone has other questions, you can feel free to submit them uh, using the Q&A function on Zoom. That's the best way uh, to help us uh, see that. Um, so here are some of the questions that we have. Uh, the first one, uh, is there a way, this is multi-part, so we'll take it little by little. Is there a way in which a work of music or art is an explanation? I don't think so. Um, I think that we should see works of art as being the products of explanations. Uh, so obviously there are explanations that go into making them, but I don't think that a work of art can itself be an explanation. The reason for this is that works of art never in any kind of unproblematic way transmit propositional knowledge. Uh, it's never just that there's a thing that's being said in a work of art. It's always uh, some interaction between what's being said and how it's being said. For example, the famous line, to be or not to be from Hamlet. What's literally being said is just, should I commit suicide? Is it worth being alive? Um, but the fact that it's phrased with the verb to be calls up all these big existential uh, resonances. And that phrasing is as important as the actual content of the word. So there's always a presentational aspect to art that I think stops it from actually giving explanations in any way. Explanations will be propositional statements, not presentational ones. And I should also just say that an explanation, if you doubt that it's propositional rather than presentational, uh, think about the fact that an explanation can be rephrased in other language, it can be translated. You don't need to read Einstein in German to know the content of the explanations, but you do need to read that verb to be to understand what Hamlet is saying. That's a fundamental <laughs> difference. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and actually, since you said you didn't think so, the, I think the rest of that question uh, that was only if, if so, but since you don't, <laughs> I don't think we. Um, uh, how valuable is an attempt to find internal evidence, for example, to use the first violin part in Mozart's clarinet quintet to inform the clarinet part? I think very important. Um, so one of the questions about explanation in general in music is what kinds of explanations can tell us what about what aspects of the music. And recently in musicology, there's been a trend towards using very external explanations, thinking about things in terms of politics and economics and social issues. And I think that one of the challenges is that without a further explanation and a rather robust one about how those external ideas link up to things inside the music, there isn't really a connection between the two. And people have tried to make connections. They've tried to say, well, maybe finances influenced Mozart's choice of keys, for example, that he needed more money. So he wrote in a key like C major, D major, E flat major. He could use trumpets and drums, write something big, symphonies, uh, earn more money, big audiences. But even that, that tells us, even if that's true, 
that gets us about as far as the key choice and not much further. It doesn't tell us why that melody or why another melody or why some beautiful chromatic term somewhere. So I think internal evidence ends up being the only real evidence that can be legitimately connected to other ideas in the music. And again, I think there will be explanations for why that's the case uh, and explanations lacking in other kinds of thinking about external forces. Uh, and then here, here was one from a, a little bit earlier who I think they're sort of trying to take your own process and apply it to maybe right. to, to you. Uh, <laughs> and they, they asked, uh, is, is your perception, meaning you, the perception of early music in the 60s, isn't that it well, it says is that is is uh well it, it, it literally says your perception of the situation of early music in the 1960s is not from personal observation is is the um, question yeah i mean aside from the fact that i hope i don't look old enough to actually have been doing early music in the 1960s and personally observed it i'll, I'll leave that aside um but no it's not at all from observation of any kind it's rather from a general explanation about how cultural ideas propagate and how they inform lots of different aspects of the culture at once. And from that, from that notion, uh, I have a hypothesis that early music was working under some of the same aesthetic ideals as modern contemporary music back then. It's not from actually observing it. Um, and it's not from the accounts of people who did observe it. It's from a general guess about how culture is, is working that then leads me to predict that there would be certain ways that we might see this playing out in musical culture at the time. Does that make sense? That it make it makes sense to me. <laughs> cool. I think, yeah. Uh, uh, and then another, uh, the last question that we actually have here, and if anyone else has a question, uh, uh, we can maybe have time for one more. Or so after this, uh, and this person says, uh, hopefully this is not too off off topic. What's your opinion on expressionist slash romanticist uh, approaches to composition and improvisation? Is there a tension between that approach and with Popper's conception of problem solving, conjecturing guesses and criticizing them? Yeah, uh, very possibly. Um, uh, first of all, I'm not sure I know exactly what you mean by a romanticist approach to improvisation, but I'm guessing that when you say expressionist, do you mean the notion that there's something of the artist's personal expression or intentions or self that's getting put into the thing that comes out? And I think that there is a problem with that. And the problem is that ultimately what's being composed has a logic of its own and that it isn't necessarily up to how the artist feels when making the, the piece of music that dictates that. So for example, uh, Monroe Beardsley has made an argument. He's the guy responsible for the famous intentional fallacy essay along with um, Wimsock. But there's, an, there's a, a, an argument in Beardsley's book on aesthetics that says essentially that expressionist theories fail because ultimately the emotions of the artist are just psychological states and any number of people go undergo any number of psychological states over any number of periods of time. Uh, and that ultimately when Beethoven, for example, chooses a C instead of a B at a certain moment, he's not doing it because he feels a certain way. He's doing it because there are certain abstract laws of music theory, for example, or certain cultural norms that he's inherited or certain, there will be, there will be reasons in the composition that a certain note is the one that one picks. And I think the same is true of improvising. It doesn't necessarily matter that improvisation is happening in the moment. It's still, there will be ways that motifs get elaborated on. There will be ways, there'll be chord progressions that are legal and chord progressions that are not legal. And I think that the way an artist feels is a very different kind of question. It's a psychological and historical question, and it might be interesting. We might want to know what Beethoven was feeling at a certain time, but I think it's a non sequitur to think that what he was feeling at that time has any bearing on why he chose a C instead of a B flat or instead of a B. Uh, that again, there will be harmonic, structural, motivic, any number of musical reasons for something like that. Sure. Well, I'm going to share uh, with the eye toward the time. I just going to briefly share uh, the slide uh, that you had with uh, your further reading and ways that others can get in touch. Um, so if uh, you're watching and you want to continue this conversation by email, uh, or I suppose on Twitter, <laughs> in much smaller, uh, it's much smaller bits and pieces, uh, the contact information for Dorian is here at the bottom of the screen right now. Um, and I'm sure there's lots for people to, to ruminate about. So if uh, anyone who didn't have a, a question answered or um, has, has comments or other ideas, uh, this is the best way to continue that conversation. Uh, we will share this uh, to our Early Music America YouTube channel. That'll be up later today and we'll be um, posting a link to that in our e-notes tomorrow. Uh, if you don't get the e-notes newsletter, you can go to the bottom of earlymusicamerica.org 
and sign up for the newsletter and, and uh, you can go back and listen uh, or watch through this presentation uh, if you want to rehear a part of it or any of the past interest sessions that we have. Um, I'm going to put in a quick plug for next week. We have uh, Elizabeth Weinfield of the Juilliard School who will be um, talking with us at the same time next Monday uh, and we'll be returning similarly to uh, two weeks ago. We'll be talking about salons again. Um, so I hope uh, everyone will have an opportunity to join us. So on behalf of Early Music America and everyone who attended today, uh, Dorian, we just wanted to say thank you. And uh, we are so glad that you could join us. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Um, please do consider uh, donating if you can to the Early Music America and Gotham Early Music Scene Relief Fund. You can find a link to that from our homepage. Uh, we have raised at this point uh, over $80,000 and uh, every single dollar goes toward early musicians in need during this time. So please do consider a donation if that's possible for you. Um, as soon as we have uh, the funds to reopen the application, then we'll be able to serve more musicians. Um, already more than 300 musicians have received mini grants um, from Early Music America. So we wanna thank everyone who has already donated. And thank you once again, everyone for joining us and we hope you'll join us next week.